So in this part, we're going to increase our Manton model to understand how a kernel works and more, more specifically how the Windows kernel works. So in, in order to have a good Manton model, we need to understand core concepts like how the Windows APIs are called and more specifically how the syscalls are called in order to go from username to kernel land. We're going to understand how the different objects are in memory. And when we talk about objects, they are not actually C++ object, they are actually structures, but that's how they name their structure. They call them objects. So we have objects like processes, threads that are executing in memory. We're going to also see how the virtual memory works to understand how each process manages its own memory in New Zealand and how the memory is managed in Canada. And finally, we're going to see what are the different sessions, how they manage different processes into sessions. Let's get started. So if we want to define what a kernel is, basically it's mainly a piece of code that is running somewhere into memory. And that goal is to actually manage the actual processes that are running on the system and to make sure they have separated memory space and to manage the actual privileges between these processes. People usually find kernel intimidating because they think it's complex. But if you think of it as another user and process that actually does that work to enforce security barriers between processes and schedule other processes, it's basically not very complex. For instance, it's, it's actually simpler than a browser. And most of the time, you don't have to care about the complexity behind everything that the kernel is doing. And you can just abstract, abstract it to what I've just said, to have a good model model of what a kernel is doing. So there are two interesting projects if you want to understand the Windows internals. The first one is Virgilius Project. This is basically a website that allows you to parse the different structures associated with Windows kernel structures. And you can see relationships between the different fields of the structures and, and browse all the structures. The idea is, the Windows kernel relies on many objects that are represented by structures. So you can parse them all, understand relationships. Also, it allows you to compare the different operating system versions where the structures have evolved over time. Another interesting project is React OS. So basically, every time you do some reversing, you want to analyze new stuff and that there are new stuff you don't know anything about. And so React OS is very nice because it gives an approximation of lots of functions that have been reversed over time in Windows. And even though React OS is based on NT, which is quite old now, most of it is still valid for modern operating system. Like I would say 90% of the logic won't be different with like Windows 7, for instance. And so, yeah, React OS is basically a, a re-implementation as open source of the Windows logic that has been reversed over time. And even if you don't rely on it for the actual decompiled functions, having all the names and the general logic is really helpful to reverse engineer new Windows versions. So Windows is based on lots of functions. And usually the logic can be thought as a core set of APIs that are used internally to do a bunch of stuff. And if you are familiar with Linux, you can think of that as something similar to libc on Linux. And so basically you would have functions implemented in like NTDLL or kernel base or, or kernel 32, like the general DLLs and windows that you, that are publicly documented and that you would call from username. So for instance, create file and create file would be wrapping, uh, a bunch of checks in New Zealand. And then it would call a, a Cisco wrapper called NT create file, another function in New Zealand. And this function would basically call the Cisco to then context switch to kernel mode. And so on the kernel side, you would have the actual syscall with the same name. So if you have an NT create file in NTDLL that is in user, in user mode, you would have a, actually have an equivalent NT create file in kernel mode, which is the syscall part called from username. And so generally the logic, the way it's implemented into the kernel is that the NT create file will actually end up calling ZW create file. And the idea behind that logic is that the kernel sometimes want to call the w create file from kernel mode, but you still want to be able to call it from user mode. So the idea is there would be some checks that are made 
to make sure everything is sane due to the context switch from user to kernel. And all these checks would be in, in NT create file in kernel. But if the kernel actually calls the syscall from kernel mode, it won't need to do all that, all that kind of checks. And it will just call ZW create file. But at the end of the day, even if you call it from user mode, it would end up calling the actual syscall ZW create file and it would just merge to the same code. But if you think of Windows APIs as actual functions you can call from a program, you can think of them as some parts implemented in user mode and some other parts implemented in kernel. The last thing you have in kernel is that you have APIs that you can't actually call from user mode. And the idea is something like x allocate pull with tag is like a function to allocate memory in kernel. So it's possible you call a function from user mode that will actually end up calling this x allocate pull with tag, but that's going to be part of other function being called. You won't be actually able to call x allocate pull with tag as is. It would just be a side effect of, of you calling something from user mode. So what is a process? So you can think of a process as some program with like a private address space enforced by the kernel. So it has its own privileges and other processes can't interact with it in general. And so this process has an executable program when it started. And it also has a list of open handles to what we call system prod objects, which are basically structures into the kernel. And the process has an associated access token, which gives the permission for that particular process associated with the user, for instance, that is actually running the process. As you would expect, the process has a PID, like a process ID, which uniquely identify it. And a process has at least one thread being executed. And the idea is the thread tracks the state of the process during the execution. And from the kernel's perspective, the process is tracked using a, an e-process structure that you would typically find on Virgilus. So this is the output of Process Explorer. So I guess most of you are familiar with this kind of output where you see the different processes running on the operating system. And so people have generally a good understanding of the username part, but they think the kernel is too complicated, but actually the relation between what you see here and what the kernel is doing is really close because you can think of the username part um, as a shadow of the actual kernel structures. And so the kernel is tracking all the all different processes using e-process structures. And what you're seeing in the in this slide is just some part of what the kernel is managing. And so if you think of the kernel as something that just tracks kernel structures, it's relatively easy. So yeah, the user mode word is largely just a shadow of kernel structures. And so the information you see in userland is just part of what the kernel is actually. And so you are exposed to lots of information in userland, but actually this is just something that is also stored in kernel into structures. And when you are calling certain APIs, you are just pulling some information out from the structures and getting all this information in userland. So if you think of the user world as just this, it helps with the mental model. And so when you're actually trying to understand what the kernel is doing, it's helpful to understand some of these structures. And just understanding some of these structures is actually useful to get a very good view of what the kernel is. And generally, you don't need to understand all the relationships between all these different structures. Just approaching certain structures is good enough. So what is a thread? As we said earlier, any process has at least one thread of execution. And so a given thread always has an associated process. And a thread is effectively some structures in the kernel to track its context and to be able to restore the state of the thread during scheduling by the kernel. And so a thread has two stacks, obviously, because for managing different privileges context to make sure we can't abuse the stack that would then be used in kernel. When there is a context switch from user to kernel, the, the thread will have its stack point to the actual kernel one. There is also an interesting structure called TLS for thread local storage. This is basically a private area related to a given thread. It's not shared with any other threads. It's not necessarily always that you're going to encounter TLS during analysis, but it's good to know it exists. And so any thread will have a, a thread ID associated with, the, with it. So in the kernel, a thread will be tracked by an e-thread structure. And so most of the time when you're executing your program in userland, most of the time will be spent between your own code in userland. But if you call some APIs that end up doing a syscall eventually, it will actually run some code in kernel mode for a little bit before it 
comes back to user mode. So this is uh, the view of the different threads in Process Explorer. As you can see, each one has a different thread ID and we can see the start address of the thread. So virtual memory is just a way of abstracting access to physical RAM or memory map files using some kind of linear address space per process because it would be too chaotic to use physical addresses. And so basically one can be virtualized is either the RAM, like the actual fast memory, the memory mapped files, which are files on this that are actually mapped in memory for fast lookup and change. And then some swap file, which is basically if there isn't any enough RAM, then the, the disk will actually be used and a file on this will actually be used to get more accessible memory. And so user and processes like to have a consistent environment to work with which is why virtual memory is used. And so in practice, a lot of virtual memory technically is there, but it might not be baked by anything in the moment. And so virtual memory is just an abstracted idea and there is not actually memory there sometimes when it's unmapped. So if you're used to 32 bits, the main thing that might come to a surprise is that on 64 bits, they don't actually use the full 64 bit address space. And so everyone is for now using the 48-bit addresses known as canon canonical address ranges. And so it's like a standardized range. And so on 32-bit, you would be looking at the lower two gigabytes of address space for user space and two gigabytes of address space for canon space, which is easy to remember. But on 64-bit, we are dealing with a slightly more confusing addresses. But the easy way to know the upper bits are set, then it, it's actually the kernel address space. So if these bits are set to the kernel address space. And if you see all zeros, it's user space, which is kind of useful. For instance, if you're looking for kernel addresses leaking to user learn, you can just look at your process memory and look for bytes st values starting with like that FFF in 64 bit values, which is kind of how people like Alex Ionesco or Juru finds such vulnerabilities. And so most memory in general is tracked by 4K chunks called pages. And each page has memory protections, typically read, write, execute, which dictate what you can do with these pages. And sometimes you have large pages of one megabyte. So this screenshot, we can see two executables, two different executables that are actually debugged with x64 dbg. And so when you are looking at processes under debugger, typically in New Zealand, you'll notice they have the same exact address spaces, but obviously these processes can't access the other process memory. So this is just an abstracted view of physical memory. And so all these addresses are managed by kernel structures that are just page tables. And again, people find these confusing, but again, they are just structures that are very well documented. And so this is a sysinternals tool called VM map, where you can basically see the different kind of memory. But for, for here, what we're interested in are things like mapped files that you can see are referenced, but in general, it doesn't help much with what the kernel memory is because it's all username here. And so, yeah, we said it already, two different processes use the same virtual address range and the illusion is, is created by the kernel. But there is a, a res recent thing in Windows since the Meltdown and Spectre patches were added. And you may see it in WinBag when you see function names containing the term shadow, when, for instance, you look at the syscalls entry points. And the reason for that is because now there are actually multiple set of page tables. And so userland has a set of page tables and the kernel addresses associated with those page tables are very limited. Whereas before all of the kernel address space was accessible through a process userland page tables. It is just that when you were executing in userland, you would not have permissions to access them. So you wouldn't be able to access the kernel address space. But this led to side channel attacks through speculative execution with things like Meltdown and Spectre. But what they do now is that they have a limited number of page tables loaded when the thread is in user mode, which means kernel addresses can't be accessed because page table entries don't exist at all, which avoids the Meltdown and Spectre problems.
Okay, so the, the concept of sessions. So basically when a user logs in, the user will have a session and all the processes will be associated with that session. And so typically these processes can't interact with other processes in other sessions. And the Windows kernel itself can introspect all the sessions and do whatever it wants. And typically you have a special, special session which is session zero, which is reserved for system services. And so when you think of the relationship between userland and kernel, and you start thinking of the kernel as a relatively simple program that manages userland, you can basically think of the hypervisor as a relatively simple program that manages the kernel. It is a very similar mental model, but with a slightly different level of, of abstraction. And so the main reason why Windows kernel exploitation is useful for attackers is that the kernel has read-write access to all userland, like it is able to access all processes and all, like most, most CPU instructions. So if you get kernel privileges, you can basically do whatever you want on the system, aside from the hypervisor, if there is one. The only thing that is worth mentioning that we'll detail later in mitigation is that the kernel typically can't execute code in user loan due to the SMAP mitigation and that even though by default a user can't like a, a user process can access another process user space obviously the kernel allows to do so by using like windows apis and, and going through kernel services so if you think about the kernel as a bunch of objects microsoft wants people to think about objects are opaque structures because you just call APIs that deal with these objects and you don't really need to understand what is done internally. But actually there are exported symbols that you can have when debugging. So you can actually see most of these objects in tunnels in practice. And so in memory, when you allocate a typical object type like a process or thread or, or file, in memory, the kernel will actually allocate an object structure in front of the actual object type you're allocating. So you would typically have an object structure in front of an e thread structure, for instance, if you're tracking a thread. And so the kernel can track specifics like what process that object is associated with, it can track memory usage and stuff like that. And so you have this sysinternals tool called WinObj, which basically allow you to list all the different object types that exist. And so typically you would you would see the process type, the thread type, or the token type we talked about already. But you can also see more fancy types like TMEN, TMRM, TM whatever, which are basically transaction manager related objects. And so you wouldn't use this WinObj tool all the time, but it's nice so you can list all the different object type that exist. So most people that do user on stuff are more familiar with like handles. It's basically the same as file descriptors on Linux. And so typically user on can't know the addresses of the objects in kernel memory. So they are abstracted through a per process handle table. And so the, proce the user on process gets an ad identifier, like an integer or also known as, as handle associated with the object that is dealing with. And so when it wants to call certain APIs, it says it gives this identifier to the kernel um, and the kernel knows, like does the translation to actually access the objects that corresponds to that handle. And so what ends up happening is you can have one object on the kernel side that is actually accessed by many processes in userland and the processes will have their own handle to access that object and the handles will typically have their own permission associated with in the kernel. So that, that will actually dictate what the process can do with that particle object. So the kernel can either allow it or deny it. And so because of the way, because of the way it works, the kernel basically tracks how many times an object is accessed with like reference counting and it bumps a, a ref count each time a new process accesses the same object. And so then the kernel can actually delete the object when no one else is actually using it anymore. And so typically if you see functions like ob open object by name or by pointer, you don't need to know internally what they do, but basically when you're reversing, 
all you have to understand is that some handle is created for an object and the handle is probably going to be returned to the caller and potentially to userland at some point so it can be reused by the program later. And so this is Process Explorer. So you can see for a given process, in this case, Elsass, you can see all the open handles and the actual object types associated with these handles. All of that for a given process. So we can see process types, thread types, token types, and the handle would be like 1884, 72, 16, etc. 